Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dave Collins. He's a carbon-based life form from Melbourne. He's uh, been programming for 25 years, uh, 25, 15, 25 years, but it took 10 years to uh, work out how to get paid for it. Um, he writes code on Linux, mostly somewhat in Python. Uh, he tries to control, sorry, not control the weather, forecast the weather at BOM, and he thinks digital watches are a neat idea. Please welcome him. Um, yeah, uh, so time is an illusion. I'm going to be arguing for the affirmative uh, in this particular discussion. Um, I'm going to start, though, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulam Nation, uh, and pay respects to their elders, both past and present. I'd also like to pay uh, my respects to the Wadawurrung people, uh, also of the Kulam Nation, um, and pay respects to their elders, past and present. And the Wadawurrung people are, for anybody who knows the geography, uh, basically the Werribee River, all the way down the Bellanine Peninsula, off to Lawn and up to uh, Ballarat. And the reason I'm going to talk about them uh, become evident in a second. So today, uh, I kind of could have fitted a million things into this talk. I gave a bit of this talk previously at, uh, at my work, and I had a lot more history and some more technical stuff in it. I've taken some of that out. I've just got one bit of history, and then I'll get on to more kind of a little bit more Python-related things. Um, I think this talk might end up being re-given in the future in, as 10 different talks, but who knows, because there's too much stuff in the world to talk about. So my one bit of history is the uh, Warang Yurang, and this is on um, Wadawurrung territory down about halfway between here and Geelong. And it's actually a 10,000-year-old sundial slash calendar. Um, it's older than Stonehenge, um, and it's, um, there's, there's some better diagrams of what it does diagrammatically, but that's a good picture of what it is. But it basically is there to tell the, uh, the transitions from the astronomical seasons. And so the Wadawurrung people um, would use this uh, and also the eel traps and various other things in the area as part of their traditional uh, agricultural, agricultural system. And when you are running essentially an agricultural uh, system, the, the time of the season and your accuracy about telling seasons is all you need. Leap forward thousands of years very quickly. Uh, what about now? Well, now we actually do still keep track of time um, with respect to the sun. Uh, but we do it in a very technical way now. Um, solar time is still measured. It's measured by a thing called U UT1. Um, it's kind of a bit like the old GMT in the sense that it's the time when the sun is kind of directly ahead of Greenwich. Um, except we actually use it based on some very distant celestial objects and we measure it with radio telescopes and we you know, keep track of it and then various teams of scientists around the world send files back and forward between each other and carefully define what UT1 is. So UT1 is out there. That's the important, the first important part of uh, understanding modern time. Now, wait a second. In 1954, we redefined the second. The second is now 9,192,631,707 periods of uh, radiation corresponding to the transition between two hyperfine uh, levels of the ground state of a cesium-133 atom. Um, the best thing I love about this particular definition was when I went and actually looked it up, I discovered there's a modern revision of it. And I kind of went, what? Like, how can you change things? But they forgot to put stuff in the standard when they made it up that said you had to be at sea level and you actually had to do it at a particular temperature. So nobody wasn't at sea level and wasn't doing it at that temperature, but now the definition is even longer and more clear and quite more precise about what a second is. So, uh, so we set atomic clocks, and they've been keeping time since 1954, and that's called International Atomic Time, uh, TIA, from the French name Temps Atomic. Sorry, Dad, I stuffed up my French. Uh, Temps Atomic. Uh, somebody French, please. Uh, Atomic <laughs> Internationale, uh, um, and so that that one got a uh, an entirely French uh, acronym. 
UTC, it's not actually an acronym. A lot of people think it's Universal Time Coordinated or something. It's not. It was actually a compromise between the English acronym and the French acronym. Um, I'm still trying to trace this, but I think this is the last time the French got their way with naming an international acronym. Like, it, it basically defines the end of the European, you know, multi-language thing and the migration to basically everything now is defined in English. Um, I'm not 100% sure like that. Uh, so, technically, UTC does not equal GMT. Um, but it's an alias now back to GMT. So if you go LS, it's, oh, I'm actually pointing to UTC. Because GMT was all about the solar time in Greenwich. It was not about keeping track of seconds quite specifically. So UTC is the atomic time adjusted to kind of keep time with the Greenwich time in, minute, in Greenwich, which is now uh, UT1 rather than GMT. And that's when your leap seconds come in. And we'll get to leap seconds later on. What about Python? Finally got a Python picture in here. This is a Woma Python or a sand Python. Uh, it's from Central Australia. It's somewhat endangered. Uh, they're very interesting. But really, what about Python? What happens when we do date time, date time now? And get out the time of now. Well, between uh, Python 2.7 and Python 3, there's actually been a massive rewrite of, of this uh, stuff in there. Um, and so now the class that actually deals with that is mostly Python with a bit of C. It used to be this whole module was essentially just C. And so we get the time for T there, and that is essentially a time since the uh, Unix epoch, January 1, 1970. Uh, which for the first couple of years of January was actually set at the epoch from in the United States, from whichever lab, Bell Lab in, I forgot where it is now, uh, and then was switched to be in, um, you, you know, essentially UTC. And then we convert this time uh, from a timestamp in some Python class and actually convert it into a Unix, a, um, a date time class that actually knows how many hours, minutes, seconds, days, and all that kind of stuff. Internally, on Unix systems, we call this pi get time of day, which returns this pi time of day, and it in turn calls uh, clock get time, clock real time. And clock real time has a resolution of nanoseconds. Um, Python date time only does milliseconds, sorry, microseconds, uh, and that's because we used to use, I presume it is, I'm not 100% sure on this, we used to use get time of day. Uh, on modern Linux systems, uh, there's three different ways of getting the time effectively. There's the old-fashioned time, which returns a time t object, which is essentially just seconds. There's get time of day, which um, is not necessarily as accurate, but it was introduced next. And then this clock get time, which can get a resolution of nanoseconds but also will tell you what resolution it thinks it actually is at. So generally it won't actually be precise to nanoseconds, um, but it'll say, oh, I'm pretty confident about you know, my milliseconds, microseconds. Um, there's actually get in um, Python 3.6, get, uh, clock get time is now exposed through the Python interface, and you can get different type of clocks. So there's clock real time, which is essentially the wall clock going along, and there's other clocks, uh, clock monotonic, which is quite interesting, and it basically means that it is always guaranteed to go forwards in time and is not linked to the actual wall clock. So it's not linked to whether or not it's now, you know, 10 o'clock. It's just simply from the, when the computer booted, I'm just going to keep going forwards. So if you do have a reason to actually have your time be correctly relative to each other, that's the way to do it. Um, the interesting thing about time and get time of day is that uh, get time of day, it now uses, in, in li modern Linux, uses uh, clock get time, so they're effectively the same resolution. But time still uses a separate older way of updating it, which means if you had an application, like I did at work, which used time in some C code and get time of day in some Python code, and you run it in really tight test loops, um, and lop off the milliseconds, they actually 
um, don't match up all the time. There's usually about half a second. There can be up to a half a second difference between them because time doesn't need to be as fast. So Linux doesn't bother updating that particular part of your memory to tell you. So that provided a great little uh, bit of debugging to try and work out what was going on there. So what about Windows? <laughs> uh, Windows uses a, um, and in the Python code, we use uh, get file time as, get system time as file time. This all actually happens in user space. Um, the previous one was using a kernel um, call to get, get time of day. This actually happens in uh, user space. So it's actually really, really fast. It just essentially just copying a little bit of memory and away you go. Uh, and it's updated and therefore it's updated regularly by internally by Windows and um, it has about um, half a millisecond resolution. So it actually isn't as accurate as your Python, as, sorry, as your Linux time. I'm fairly sure that the Mac OS is exactly the same, but I, I don't, don't own a Mac and didn't get around to borrowing one to hit it with a few probes to work out what it was doing. So these things are basically asking the different ways of asking the computer, what is the time in UTC so that I can go and do stuff to it. So how does a computer know UTC? Actually, technically doesn't know UTC because like all really great international standards, UTC is strictly defined as this time that all the atomic clocks plus the leap seconds and you only really know when the atomic clocks are accurate after all the atomic clocks have sent each other files and produced a drift file. So you can actually go on the internet and get the drift file and every month they say how much is actually out by and at that moment you can retrospectively know what your time was at a previous time. <laughs> so if you are in the unfortunate case of really needing high precision time for some crazy thing, your computer won't actually give you really crazy precision UTC. It kind of just gives you a cached version of UTC. Um, and as we know, there's only two hard problems in computer science, naming things, cache invalidations, and off by one errors. Um, so basically there's a thing called um, NTP, which is essentially the way computers uh, keep time. Network time protocol. Windows computers have it. If you're on a local domain, uh, you probably at work, your computer probably just speaks a different thing to the local domain. I actually don't know much about that and gets the time from the domain pretty much just as a, here's the time, here's the time. But UT, uh, NTP basically talks to other computers and says, oh, what do you think the time is? Oh, well, I think it's this time. And they all kind of sync and get the time. You can uh, put a GPS on your network and use the GPS will eventually just work out and start spitting out uh, UTC. And so then you can, you know, have computers. So if your time's important on your network, you'll end up having some computers talking to the outside world, getting the NTP, and a local GPS. That, of course, is not without problems. So because NTP is constantly adjusting your time to make sure you're keeping in track, your time, your real-time clock, can and does change in... I put the word random in there, but it's, it's not really random. It's, it's kind of arbitrary way. So it can go forward and can go back. So your, your computer can actually have discontinuities in time. So let's have a look at some discontinuities in time. <clears throat> I'm actually going to start with one of the easiest discontinuities, which is time zones. Uh, now, most people here probably are very comfortable with time zones, but I have met developers around the world who don't understand them. Uh, so we're basically trying to keep each bit of the world having its concept that local solar time at midday means the sun's up there, it's all great. And that's essentially what time zones are about. Except India and China just basically said, we want one time zone across our whole country and it's going to be that. And so the people in um, Western China essentially don't really follow the time zone when it comes to doing unofficial stuff because otherwise they have to wait another three hours before getting up in the morning. Uh, they just live their lives and when they have to talk to the government, they use the time zone. And the governments actually make these things up. They can just change them at any time. I had a friend who was flying through from um, Brazil through Peru to uh, Australia and he arrived in Peru and Peru had decided <clears throat> with a week's notice to extend its daylight savings by two weeks 
And so none of the computer systems, phones or anything, managed to get the updates. Well, not none of them, because that would have been OK. Some of them managed to get the updates, <laughs> and some of them didn't. So you're suddenly in an international airport with a young kid, you're tired, and time is an illusion. You're, you've got no idea. Now, a mistake I've seen some people make is assume that all time zones are integer offsets. Sometimes people assume time zones are half hour offsets and go and implement their own sort of thing. Um, most of them are only half hour or hour around the world. But there are some uh, in what is called the Olsen database, although it's now uh, maintained by IANA, <clears throat> that are actually in like, uh, you know, 36 minutes and stuff. So, um, and in Olsen, the Sojourner time zone is still in there, but it's not actually kind of an official time zone in a sense. It's just Sojourner in South Australia kind of operates or did operate on that time. Um, so Olsen was essentially maintained this database for many, many years, and essentially he did it mostly himself, and he also was the BDFL, BDFL which effectively meant, as you might have all noticed, um, Australian time zone codes were on Linux computers were AST and ADT, and a couple of years ago you could get AEST and A. DST. And we got the A added in front of it, which was always our name. And essentially, that was when Olsen lost control. People were able to get that change made. So in a sense, this, this the kind of <coughs> time zones are very important, but the actual infrastructure for keeping track of them globally is a lot more flaky than it kind of makes out. So if you're working on international stuff and you've <coughs> got some stuff that goes into somewhere you know, you think, oh, well, I know the time zones. They're all really easy around the world. Well, sometimes they can just change arbitrarily. And you've got to keep up and keep on them. Uh, also, the French have 14 time zones across the countries that they control. So what is the time in France? <laughs> Daylight savings. We all know about that. It's um, uh, when local time leaps forward or leaps back. This is actually a discontinuity in Windows. Um, pretty much all Windows computers, the real-time clock inside them isn't ticking at UTC, it's actually ticking in local time, which means when you boot up into the BIOS, which most Windows users don't do now, the time is the local wall clock, which is kind of handy. Um, except if you shut down the computer and bring it up again, it's got to actually do that leap for daylight savings at that time. And anybody, and I would imagine there's probably plenty of people here who dual booted a computer so you could play games or do some Windowy stuff and some nods, uh, and Linux on the other one would know that your computer would, you know, you'd boot back into Windows and go, oh, I haven't done it. And suddenly your computer would leap to two hours off. Mongrel, you can solve that now because there is a uh, hack which you have to put in the registry to make your Windows computer run at real time. So just Google for real time clock on Windows and that'll make the real time clock internally run at UTC, which means it can handle time zones, daylight savings transitions and that sort of stuff. And so you get 23. 25 hour days. <clears throat> in Python 3.6, we've got this, this extra little thing created, which is um, a fold flag. And so if you ask for a date time, um, it can actually return this, this flag, which will tell you that the local time you've asked for, it's actually the second time today you've experienced that time. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> it doesn't work when you're drunk. I tried it. <laughs> Um, but basically it means that during the daylight savings transition, the second time you ask for that time and it's suddenly you know, 2.30 in the morning again, you can actually tell that from your local time. That's kind of handy. So the, the big nasty one is, is leap seconds. And these can be added or, or removed. They haven't ever been removed. Whenever UT1, i.e. the sun, uh, and UTC differ by more than uh, 0.7 seconds. And so since they were introduced, when they were introduced in 1972, we actually had 10 seconds added straight away. Uh, and then we've had 27 seconds. Yeah, I, I m must not have mattered back in 1972 because I haven't heard any stories about, well, back in 1972, we had a leap, 10 seconds. Um, but, now, but now we've got these leaping one seconds and everybody complains about them. Now, why do we have leap seconds? We have leap seconds because the Earth 
and the moon are spinning around each other and the moon is slowing down the earth slightly. We also have earthquakes and the big Boxing Day tsunami from 2005, 2006, seven, some year. It actually added uh, 0.5, the, the change, but the difference from that one incident was 0.5 of a second between uh, UT1 and UTC on that time alone. So we basically needed to add a leap second pretty much straight away. Now, <clears throat> it's all a mess. No mainstream operating system actually deals with leap seconds. They're essentially just a discontinuity and a leap in time. You can't actually find out through any standard method on a computer saying how many leap seconds there are and is there a leap second. So if you actually care how many seconds there are between three years ago and now in exactly the number of seconds and you ask your, your computer, it'll tell you that, that a number of seconds that won't include the leap seconds in that time frame. Now, for almost all applications, that doesn't matter, which is why that bug has never been fixed. And the thing is, NTP knows about it, because <coughs> it kind of needs to, but it doesn't sort of just casually go, oh, we're just going to go for this second. Because it needs to convert to Unix time, which is this time without leap seconds, it pretty much just tells everybody the time has changed, and the computers try and rush towards that new second as quickly as they can get themselves in sync. Which means if you've got processes running over that that need um, second precisions or anything, you can just get a complete mess. <coughs> Excuse me. Google took the NTP code and um, modified it, and now they put the second in over that, sort of over a 24 hour period around the leap second. They sort of skew the time, just gently smooth it in. Okay, that's good, but if you have a computer and you've pointed it's one of your NTP servers to a Google one, one of them to something else, you're going to get mixed signals. And NTP can deal with mixed singles, signals if it gets, you know, basically, if it gets most of them in agreement. So if you've got three NTP servers you're hooked up to, two say this is the time and one says this is the other time, it ignores the one that says it's the wrong time. But if you've only got two hooked up, because one of them has fallen over, Computers actually start ignoring that and start drifting. And virtual machines like to drift quite quickly. Uh, there was a problem at my work once where uh, the, they had some NTP outages. I think maybe the internet NTP was not working and uh, one of the GPSs they brought in uh, didn't deal with leap seconds properly and suddenly, after a firmware upgrade, suddenly decided to insert a future leap second right now. Um, this meant that some of, the, some of the desktop computers all added the leap second and a bunch of the virtual machines just stopped updating their time. So they just started wandering off randomly in time. Um, <clears throat> so there are other discontinuities. There's a bug in uh, Lotus Notes um, that decided that 1990, sorry, 1900 was not a leap year. Oh, sorry, it was a leap year when it wasn't a leap year. They didn't do the and has to divide by 400. That has made it, well, it's made it, it, for a period of time, made its way into Excel and then also made its way famously via Joel on software uh, into VBA. So if you go back to that period, you actually, <laughs> have you read that article and remembered that one? <laughs> yes. Um, so that one's a, uh, a, a, quite, a quite interesting one. As you can see, there's also some information there about calendar adoptions. Uh, I've had no real reason to go back in time and look at these things, but if you're working in genealogy and you're trying to work out you know, how old somebody lived for or how many generations of stuff, there's all these discontinuities around the world when dates are recorded and times are recorded and <clears throat> whether or not you're Catholic or not. Um, so yes, so let's just quickly go to printing dates and there's an XKCD. There's only one way you should print dates. Use the ISO um, 8601, print them out, year, year, dash, month, month, dot, 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 dot. Most um, people not in the United States seem to get that. Most people in the United States also get that, but, you know, we've worked with people who don't. Um, I've just realised I'm running a little slow, so I'm going to speed up. Now, parsing dates, this is actually a real problem. It's actually missing from the standard library. There's no way to take 
an ISO 8001 and actually parse it. Like I don't necessarily want it to be able to parse all sorts of weird date formats, but just being able to parse a sensible one, I think, should be in there. Um, <clears throat> if you do it, you can do it by specifying in here, we specify a lovely format string. A quick thing to note, in, this is in Python 3.6, uh, 3, that's formatting plus 10, uh, plus 1,000. This one, uh, um, in here, we've got a colon in there. So when it's printed out, it can't actually parse the code as it stood when I git cloned. Um, couldn't handle the colon in the parser. Anyway, the world is getting better. And that's not to mention other standard date formats, like if you just take date on a Unix machine. So let's just quickly go through. Hey, cheese shop to the rescue. Um, so I went through a quick bunch of these things and determined whether or not they could parse different sorts of dates. So the pretty much standard one, pretty much any of them could parse. Some of them didn't necessarily return a date, a Python date time object. They had their own object, which had to convert to date time. Um, everybody but Arrow managed to convert the one with GMT in it. I think by ignoring the GMT and this managed to get get the date correct. Um, <clears throat> and they also managed to deal with the one with the AEST, which is my time zone. But none of them seem to deal with these other time zones, even though they are valid time zone things. So I don't, I didn't actually delve down into why a number of them were actually parsing that correctly, but they didn't pick up the time zone out of there. So, uh, one, two, three, uh, there's some flags in those top ones which will basically say, is the date first, is the time first. If you have to do more than that, you may as well just specify a format string to save you the effort. Um, Pendulum only had one answer, and Arrow put in a stack trace which was about two pages telling me why it couldn't work out the date. Yeah. Good stuff. So, uh, you should test against time. You should mock or freeze the time to do your tests, or uh, mock and set an offset which it stops it to a time but then continues on from that time. There's a couple of examples, freeze frogs and freeze ray, uh, where you basically put it in your tests and your test will be in that time. You'll ask for your date times and they'll actually return those times. And these are particularly useful uh, when you need to test. So you should test for 23 and 25 hour days. So if you've got something that, you know, is basically going, oh, how many hours are there in this day? I'm going to allocate some certain things, maybe work out how many days, how many hours there are that I'm going to forecast something for. You need to take into account 23, 25 hour days. You also need to test over the transition to daylight savings. If you're going to do some local time stuff, you need to do with that. Um, and if you're really precision, you need to deal with, if you get down to precision, you need to basically have some code that tests around local time just moving around. Um, with uh, NTP and various things like that. So I'd just like to share with you <clears throat> this particular picture that uh, a senior person at the Bureau noticed. She was catching a flight. Let's just zoom in on the important bit. It's a digital clock. Like it's entirely on a computer screen and the analog clock How is that even possible? <laughs> so clearly, time is an illusion and lunchtime is doubly so. So, thank you very much. Thank you. There's probably just enough to squeeze in one question. If anyone's got one? So what time is it? Uh, the t <laughs> it's lunchtime. Uh, it's 12.34 uh, uh, p.m. Pretty much, approximately. <laughs> Thank you very much for an entertaining and insightful talk. Um, Thank you very much.